On March 24, 2014, the Malaysian prime minister got up in front of a press conference and said that the plane had gone south and that therefore had ended in the southern Indian Ocean and implied that therefore everyone on board must be considered dead. There was no physical evidence for this. The prime minister's statement was based entirely on a novel mathematical analysis of unprecedented radio signals that had been sent from the plane. Specifically, it had to do with the frequency at which the signals had been sent. The response was an uproar. Many of the relatives of the people on board the plane were outraged that their loved ones could be declared dead on the basis of math alone. In today's episode, we're going to talk about what that math was and how the officials had reached their conclusion. Hi, everybody. Jeff Wise back with you with episode seven of season one, Deep Dive MH370. Again, this episode was originally part of a series that I recorded with Andy Tarnoff. Uh, at the end of season one, we went our separate ways. I no longer have access to the original YouTube channel. So I am editing and remastering these episodes and making them available here. As always, if you enjoy the show, please consider subscribing. Also, we have a show page at deepdivema370.com where you can get a free weekly newsletter and there are updates and original information uh, about these episodes, as well as my new season, Finding MA370. You can also sign up for a paid subscription, which earns you my undying gratitude. Okay, let's get on with the show. This is a part of the mystery that very few people actually understand this part of the evidence. And there's, a, off a, there's an awful lot of, of ideas and theories that are floating out there about MH370. And very, very few of them incorporate an understanding of how this data works, how it's generated, and how it's interpreted. So we're going to get into that today. So we've been watching as the plane took off from Beijing, flew to Malaysia, turned back, all the electronics went dark, it flew up the Malacca Strait, it was on military radar. Um, and then we spent a lot of time talking about how the SATCOM system came, it turned back on. And we, we spent last week talking about how that could have happened and whether that was very weird or maybe not that weird. Um, and so now we're at a point where, and then we also have talked about what some of this metadata means. We talked about half of the metadata, what's called the burst timing offset. And we explained how that gave a sense of these ping rings and that, that from that scientists derived a sense of the roots so now we're going to talk about the second set, which is called Burst Frequency Offset, or BFO. Okay, so you'll recall on March 15th, 2014, the Malaysian Prime Minister held a press conference, and he announced that Inmarsat, the uh, British-based uh, satellite uh, company, had collected data, and it, the plane had flown on for six more hours after it had disappeared from radar. And the Inmarsat satellite uh, scientists had already analyzed the first set of data, the BTO, to determine that it went north or south, and then... Um, he gave this press conference on March 24th that said they had devised a new mathematical technique to, to determine that the plane had gone south. Let's, let's play that. This is a remote location, far from any possible landing sites. It is therefore with deep sadness and regret that I must inform you that according to this new data, flight MH370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean. So, right. So, to recap, they had already figured out that the plane went either north or south, but they didn't know which. The first set of metadata gave them a very specific route but it also gave the mirror image of that route and they didn't know what, which one was correct. Now with this new set of data, BFO, it said, okay, this, this allows us through some mathematics that must have been very hairy because it took them weeks, but they've managed to crack this mathematical nut and now we know that it went south. So they've announced that like the plane definitely went south, which means it went into the ocean, therefore everyone is dead, which is quite a thing to lay on the, the, you know, the family members. And they kind of went, uh, and who blames them? And it was horrible. Yeah. Uh, and it was based on um, these scientists and these mathematicians' um, understanding of BFO, which uh, 
that's not one of those terms that uh, average people would know what BFO data is, but you do. So I think you should explain it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't know what it was. I mean, nobody had heard, when when the officials made this announcement, we all felt like, OK, you're telling us that you've solved this riddle. But what how do we how do we know that what you're saying is true? I mean, you, you seem like nice people. But, you know, we, we, you, you've been a little bit um, fuzzy about some of the things you've said in the past, and we don't know if we completely believe you. So we'll give you finally released the data. They finally gave some clues about their explanation. And finally, people working together on the Internet, this is a story I've told before, but people had various expertises that they brought together and they shared on various forums and websites. And one of them was my personal website, jeffwise.net. And also through emails with, with one another. And basically they pieced together a sense of what was going on with this data. Now, until that happened, I myself, I have to confess, I really thought that the plane most likely went north. And just pretty much for, for one reason, which is that we've already been talking about how the way that this plane behaved suggested that somebody had taken it who was sophisticated and that they knew how to like they knew how to fly a plane for one thing. They also knew about communications. They knew where the boundaries of airspace was and all of these things. It sounded like somebody who really knew a lot about planes and flying and satellite communications and so forth. But it also seemed to me that they were motivated, that they had taken this plane, done a dramatic turn, flew really fast. It just seemed like somebody whose mindset was very action oriented and very very results oriented, not like someone who wanted to commit suicide. There's lots of cases of people who have crap, not a lot. There's a handful, like a few less than five examples of people who we know have taken a plane and crashed it into the ground. But those people usually just crash it as quickly as they can. They don't fly for six hours until the fuel runs out. So to me, it just seemed like these are people who would want to go to land. So I wanted to write a piece about that this plane went north to Kazakhstan. And my editor was like, everyone else says it went south. Don't you feel worried about that? And I was like, listen, if I'm wrong, I will write a, an apology. <laughs> I will apologize to the world for speculating that it went north. To make a long story short, when the uh, prime minister made this announcement, I was like, OK, I know it sounds like I'm wrong, but let me just try to figure out this BFO data. So let me just confirm for myself that what he's saying is true, that I believe it too. And so she let me take a couple more weeks to kind of sort through the math. And I finally sorted through the math and I understood it. And I wrote a column saying, I apologize. Yeah, that was a, I read that and that must not have been fun to do. But, you know, it's, you, you, had, you, you made you know, your you promise. Take your yeah, so, so you did that. And to recap, the reason you thought it might have gone to Kazakhstan was because of the ping rings, which we discussed in episode five, I believe. So the, the, the right. terminus of, of where this flight could have gone was either in Central Asia or it was in the Southern Indian Ocean. Um, but once right. you... So it wasn't completely crazy. Yeah, you didn't it just pick that country like later, out of a later, No. And later some people would say, oh, I think it went to San um, Diego Garcia, which is someplace completely different that there's no evidence whatever it went there. That is sort of groundless. But mine actually was, wasn't was that crazy. It was like, it was we knew it was in one of two places and I just thought it was in one. Most people thought it was in the other. It was very respectable. But once this, once the prime minister made this announcement saying we've solved, we've, we've done this math. Okay, so today, mostly what we're going to talk about today is why I was wrong. Why I did this, how I did this math. Yeah, sure. so to do that, you have to understand what BFO data is, um, and it involves the right. Doppler effect, which now I feel like I'm in, like, you know, eighth grade science here. Um, <laughs> if you, it involves the Doppler effect and some other things. Yeah, yeah. I would say geosynchronous orbit is one which of Which I did not learn in eighth grade, but I did learn about the Doppler effect, and the easiest way that, uh, the thing that I think about with the Doppler effect is is the train horn, how, how you, you know, you right. hear it starting at a high pitch, and then as it drives past you, you hear a low pitch, kind of like this video. <laughs> So what we saw there was the Doppler effect in action. When two bodies are moving towards each other, it has the effect of making a frequent, the frequency go up, whether it's sound, as in this case, or light, uh, or you know, radio waves are a kind of, of light. And radio waves are how satellites communicate with airplanes. And so 
the, the, the reason the Doppler effect matters in this case is because when satellite engineers designed this system, they were allocated a frequency band. Um, with which they were allowed to communicate with their users on the ground. So imagine you're up 23,000 miles above the Earth. This is the ge geometry at which if you orbit the Earth at this altitude, your speed will match the rotation of the Earth. So it's very handy if you want to be a communication satellite. You can basically just park yourself over a certain spot, and everyone knows you're there. And anyone who wants to talk to Inmarsat can just point their antenna at you, and there you are. And it's very handy. You're like a sky, it's like a sky hook. You're just this point in the sky. Um, and so you're looking down from this high altitude and you're looking down over a huge portion of the Earth. I mean, this satellite is basically covering the entire Indian Ocean yeah. Basin, which includes East Africa, the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, um, a huge, huge area, many, many you know, billions of people and billions of radio frequency devices, everything from, you know, um, garage door openers to cell phones to you know so many devices use radio frequencies rfid tags etc yeah the radio frequency spectrum um that's a separate conversation for a different day but you know that's that's why you know cell phones spend billions of dollars to buy their little piece or cell phone companies buy their little piece right. of the frequency so uh so the yeah. satellite has a very narrow has a very narrow band right so um the, the planes need to stay within this yeah. band. And I equate it to, right. um, to, to like AM radio, for example. Like if I'm listening to a baseball game right. in, in Milwaukee uh, and right. the station is 620, I can hear it at 620 clearly. If I, you know, if I had an old-fashioned radio and I tweaked it to 622, 625, I could hear it a little less. And sooner or later, you lose the signal and it turns into something else. Right. So they... Uh, the, the satellite engineers have to deal with that as well, right, Jeff? That's right. So they're looking, they've, they've been allocated this narrow frequency band, and they're looking down at this huge swath of the Earth, and they are looking for this exact specific frequency. And so they can ignore everything else. But this presents an effect, but these planes are moving towards and away as they move around, as they go about their, their daily business, they're moving to or and from, and that relative velocity is gonna change the frequency that the, that the satellite antenna is gonna receive that uh, signal at. So say it's 620, you may use the example of 620. Right. So say it's they're looking for 620, and the plane is broadcasting at 620, but because the plane is moving towards the satellite, that 620 becomes 624, say. Yeah. Now it's the wrong frequency. Right. So it would make it more difficult to keep an eye on it because it's not where it's supposed to be. But they have accomplished right. uh, a technology for dealing with this. Yeah, they did a kind of clever thing. It's not super clever, but... I think it's, it's pretty clever. A, it's its name is... It's, <laughs> that's, you know... <laughs> it's okay. All right, you're right. It's clever. But it has, it has a name that's a mouthful, so it sounds a little intimidating. It's called Doppler Precompensation. And what this means is that if the, if the plane know the plane knows that it's moving, it knows where the satellite is, and it knows that because it's moving, it's going to send a signal that's going to be received at the wrong frequency. And so, if I send it at 620 and it arrives at 624, that's a problem. So, hmm, what if I send it at 616, and by the time it gets to the satellite? It's now been bumped up to 620, and voila, the problem is gone. Satellite's getting the signal at the frequency it likes. Doppler precompensation. Okay. I mean, does that make sense? That's pretty, not even that complicated, It, it actually right? makes a ton of sense to me. You know, the plane itself okay. is adjusting, I don't know, it feels like a CB, like adjusting the squelch or something like yeah. that, where, yeah. uh, well, okay, maybe I'm not, okay, I'm not a CB guy, but, so squelch might be the wrong word, sorry, <laughs> but it's a, you, you, yeah. like you're adjusting something, so it falls within the accepted parameters, and therefore right. you get it at the signal, uh, at the frequency that you're supposed to, so... Right. Exactly. I, I frankly think you have um, an even cooler analogy that you wrote about. Okay. Uh, I just love this story okay. so much because uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. And I, it's, it's the okay. foghorn in the drunken brother-in-law who steals your boat story. And I feel like we would be remiss because we're not in a hurry here if you didn't tell this story to explain uh, speed versus velocity versus Doppler versus just 
could you please tell the story? I love it. I was yeah. So I was trying to find an analogy that might feel more relatable to people, and I don't know if this is relatable or not. But I was I was saying like, imagine that you are you have this lake house, and you have a drunken brother-in-law, and he steals your boat, your motorboat, and he's zooming around in the lake, and that's frustrating to you because you really want to know where your expensive beloved boat is, and he's zooming around, and he's so drunk that he's sort of blasting a foghorn as he's driving around, and you shout, "You jerk! You stole my boat!" And every time you yell at him, he honks back in return. Now, imagine that you know how quickly he, it takes him to respond. You can, just from the speed of sound and how long it takes, you can figure out how far away he is from you. That's the BTO part. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally did. Um, but then you add in the Doppler side of it, which is if the, the right. tone of the air horn is different, you can make certain assertions or assumptions. Uh, the, the volume of it is different. Right. You can make different assumptions. So it's... It's it's not it's not unlike the guy the brother-in-law tooting his horn. You don't necessarily know exactly where he is, but you can get a sense of where he is based on how he's farting around with his air horn. Right, exactly. And so if he, you know if the if the um, foghorn frequency goes down, then he's moving away from you, and if it goes up, he must be moving towards you. What's happening with this? Um, with this Doppler precompensation is a little different, and it's a little more subtle. Um, so the question we have to ask next is, okay, we know that this plane, this, the, the SD, the satellite data unit, is performing this Doppler precompensation. And the question is, how is it doing it? And there's actually two answers to that question. There's two different manufacturers that make these boxes. And one of them compensates it one way and another does it the other way. The first way is, is used by a company called Rockwell. And they make a, um, a, a, an SDU that uses a very simple method. They measure the frequency coming in from the satellite. They see what the error is there, and they just they just assume that since the relative velocity is the same no matter which way you're heading, they just flip it around. And so if they're expecting 620 from the satellite and they get 624, they just subtract it and broadcast it back at 616. Okay, simple. Um, for whatever reason, the other company, which is called Talus, um, they use a different procedure. They actually calculate using navigational information that the plane has, namely, this is where I am, what direction I'm going, and how fast I'm flying. And I know where the satellite is, and I can use that. Now, this is a lot of math. For me, I would be disgruntled because this is going to take a lot of time for me with a pencil and paper. But for a computer, it's pretty easy. They just really run the numbers in a microsecond, and then boom. And they can calculate it. Okay, so, yeah. So, uh, first of all, MH370 did use Talus and not Rockwell, right? It's lucky for MH370 investigators because, as we'll talk about later, the fact that it was Talus and not Rockwell actually means a completely different outcome for the whole MH370 investigation. Yeah, okay. So, if the system is working properly, then it, all of the signals will arrive at the satellite at exactly the correct frequency. And this is what the BFO value is there to measure. The satellite engineers are always looking to record this because they want to make sure that their system is working properly. They want to record the BFO. And it's like looking at your oil temperature on your car. It's like, you, you, you know, you just want to make sure your oil temperature is in the right thing because if it goes out of whack, you need to take it into the shop. So they have this thing. They just record the BFO value to make sure that it's staying in that frequency parameter that they've been allocated. Now, it should always be zero. It's like your your car oil temperature should always be right at the proper line, and the BFO value should always be zero because the, the system should be working perfectly. However, and if that had been the case, again, this whole mystery would have taken a very different course. The system was not working. Which is an absolutely amazing, call it a coincidence, call it not a coincidence, but the fact that right. the satellite was not as stationary as it was supposed to be because it was an old, right. about to be decommissioned or should have been decommissioned, technically obsolete satellite that was running low on fuel, it once again right. changes everything. There's yet another twist right. in this story. Yeah. The, the wobbly I mean, the satellite thing like, just... It, yeah, just please enlighten enlighten the listeners and viewers. The devil is in the details, which is why we're having this podcast. It's all in the details. And here's a really interesting detail. As you say, the satellite was old, 
Now, when you launch a satellite like this, you put it into orbit, and if you give it the right velocity, it will be over that point, and it will stay over the same spot every single day. But nothing's perfect in life. You know, maybe this, the radiation is shining on it, or maybe there's some solar wind or something, and the thing starts to drift. It starts to get out of whack. And so what you do is you have a bit of fuel on board called hydrazine, and it basically lets you shoot little jets of correcting rocket exhaust so that you can push yourself back to where you need to be. Now, these things can only carry so much hydrazine, and eventually you start to run out, and then you start to wobble. You start to make a kind of figure eight pattern up and down above the equator, and you, and you go higher and higher and faster and faster until the whole thing becomes useless, and then it has to be decommissioned entirely. This thing was not yet decommissioned. Before you go on, can I just ask you how the hell you know about how satellite fuel? I mean, <laughs> how much time in your life have you? This, we, nobody knew it. I mean, I, I, I didn't. I didn't know any of this except until MA370 happened. We were like, what are they talking about when they say that the BFO value tells them that it went south? And all the, all the things I'm telling you today are things that we the collectively, the independent group and other um, independent investigators on the internet manage to kind of scour and find the data and find the explanation. And there are people out there who's ju every morning they wake up and they put on their pants and they go to manage a fleet of communication satellites. It's normal for them. It's super weird and arcane to us. But for somebody, every every weird arcane thing we talk about in this podcast, for somebody that's a normal day in the office. Is, are you the are you and the your former friends at the independent group, the only people who know about the wobbly satellite, or was that acknowledged by Inmarsat, by Malaysia, uh, or was that just brushed under the rug? It's been acknowledged. You just have to go read the papers. I mean, they've published papers about it. The explanation is all out there. It's just that not everybody has the time or the inclination to go dive that deep oh, into it. Oh, okay. Here, hence the, hence here the, we are. Okay, so let's keep going. Here we are. Um, where were we? Okay, so the satellite's not stationary, and it's causing a velocity error of around 20 miles per hour, right. which is causing the BFO data not right. to be zero. Uh, what does that mean? Right. What it means is that the system isn't working as intended. And because it's not working as intended, there's actually a bit of navigational signal, you could say, that has kind of leaked into this metadata that's not supposed to have any navigational information right. in it. And this is why. Now, this is probably like the, d the, d the depths. So we're in our little submarine. Okay. We're at the bottom. Pay of attention, the everyone. <laughs> okay, Take your, drink your yeah. coffee, people. The, the system on board... MA370 that was making all of its calculations on what frequency it should transmit at assumed that the satellite was stationary. It was not. So it was not correcting for the Doppler effect fully. And so that allowed scientists, after a lot of math, they spent a lot of time working on this and they really scratched their heads and it took them weeks, which is a long time in math, people trying to solve math problems at times. And they eventually figured out that if, let's, let me give you an example. If the plane is going south and the satellite is also going south, then the difference in velocity between them is going to be less, right? If the plane is going north while the satellite is going south, then the Doppler shift is going to be greater because the frequency difference is going to be greater and the velocity difference is greater. And so basically, because the satellite went, basically during the time that the plane was being abducted, the satellite was going up and then it was coming down. And the plane was either going south or was going north during this whole time. And so they looked at these differences and they modeled which one would be more similar to what they saw, and it was more similar to the south. Again, the serendipity here is amazing because this wouldn't have worked had the plane been going east or west. This only, this, this conclusion only happened because the satellite was traveling parallel to the direction of the plane. That's unbelievable to me. Right. <laughs> well, it wasn't traveling exactly parallel, but there was a, st but it only, it, it only worked for discriminating north-south differences. And there was a large north-south difference in this one. So yeah, if it had been just if it, if the question was because remember when the plane turned back, it flew basically west. Yeah. And if it had just kept going west, the the BFO data would not have been able to discriminate the the choice. Um, so yeah, that that is kind of interesting. Also, I wonder if it's significant that when this plane vanished from Malaysian radar and it started issuing these ping rings, 
and these BFO values, it was right on the equator. And so one of the one of the one of the paths went from the equator north and the other went from the equator south. And so you got this really nice, clean signal that you might not have if the entire thing had happened like in the far northern hemisphere or something like that. So it did work out quite well. It's amazing. Keep going, please, while I continue to try to not <laughs> let my head implode. I'm following you. So I, so I and my fellow, um, you know, nerds rolled up our sleeves and did the math. And I made a spreadsheet and I made like little charts and stuff. And I and I was like, I did the math, you know, two or three times. I'm like, this is definitely I understand what they're talking about. And I made my little charts and they look kind of like the charts that these guys put out. And I'm like, and, and, and on the other people in the independent group were doing the same thing. And we were all like, you know what? That's right. This plane did go south. And so I was wrong. I was like, I, I was wrong. And so I, I sheepishly went to my editor and I, and I said, look, I'm going to write a piece for you explaining why I was wrong. And I, um, and I wrote a piece saying this is why I was wrong about the thing. And I, sort, and I sort of said, like, I, I don't feel ashamed that I'm wrong. I, like, was working with the information that I had at the time. And now I have more information. And I reviewed it. And, I, and my guess was incorrect. I made a guess and it was wrong. I, there it is. I said I don't feel too bad. And she said, thank you. They ran it. And she was like, but you know what? You actually, <laughs> you actually promised me an apology. Oh, <laughs> which this is that your, your apology wasn't good enough. Okay. Wow. Ouch. And she was like, that was more of an explanation. I wanted specifically an apology. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? And she's like, yes. And I was like, okay. So you did it. Wonderful editor. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, Tori Bosch. And we're going to put up a link for this so you can see Jeff's mea culpa. Uh, the, the graphic that I'm showing on the screen right now is uh, titled uh, MH370 Burst Frequency Offset Analysis, 450 Knots. I, okay, I'm sorry, I'm an international communications major, so I haven't taken this kind of math in a long time. I don't expect anyone to fully be able to understand this, but if you, if you do, here, here's, here's the, the graph, the chart that convinced you that the plane went south. Yeah, I'll put in a link to the article too, sort of explaining the the logic a little bit. Um, it, it's not really that bad. I mean, it, it is kind of like high school level. Yeah, algebra, I wasn't very good at high school honestly. level algebra either, but you know, <laughs> but you were, so it's okay. Yeah, um, it's it, it. It was a stroke of luck in a sense that this plane was carrying an SDU that was made by Talus and not Rockwell. Yeah. Because if it was Rockwell, they would have just it just would have measured the incoming signal and flipped it around and sent it back out. And you would have had a BFO zero of zero. It's only because it had this particular box and because the satellite was wobbly and because the plane had a strong north south, you know, discrimination between the two routes that all of this came together. So the so this the, I can't tell you how excited everybody was. The independent group was excited. The um the scientists at Inmarsat and later the Australian scientists who further developed the work, they were incredibly excited. They were like, we, I mean, this is like a math nerd's wet dream. Sorry, math nerds. <laughs> I think you can say wet dream on a podcast. Because all the times your friends were like, dude, math is, math sucks. Math is like, I'm never going to use math in my, in my real life. Yeah, you win like a Nobel and Prize for this. Like, dude, we just use yeah, math. Yeah, they solved, the, they, solved <laughs> they solved the mystery. And in fact, had they, you know, this is what they used to, to go look for it. And had they found the plane there. Right. Problem solved. Done. Well, I, I, I've talked to people, um, and I could probably dig up the audio if I look around, but I talked to them, and, I, and they were like, we, in our estimation, like, we had solved it. The BTO value told us which route it took, and then the BFO t- told us which, which those routes was correct, and we had a pretty tight, and, and we can put up on the screen the, 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 the search area that they generated. There was a probability, because... There's a certain kind of uncertainty in the accuracy of the signals that you're getting. Um, and there's a certain there's a certain various different possible routes that you could have taken that would give you valid signals. So there's a certain kind of leeway and play in the data yeah. that doesn't tell you like exactly to, down to a micron level where the plane went. But it gives you a very, very specific idea of where in the Southern Ocean this plane was last heard from. And it was presumably last heard from, We which we, we'll talk about in a future episode, but like they presumably like was in the process of running out of fuel and crashing into the ocean as it sent the last signal. So we know pretty much where it, exactly where it was as it was crashing into the ocean, which is great. We have solved the greatest aviation mystery on in Earth history, right? By I math. think those by mathematicians were math. probably high-fiving each other because at this point, all they would have had to do was put their $350 million in resources into searching in that 
giant spot or small spot and they would have found the plane. No more podcast. Problem solved. We're done. Let's go home. But alas, there's so many reasons. There's so many reasons why we shouldn't be having this podcast right now. In a way, I mean, in many ways, I wish we weren't, Jeff, because then we wouldn't have to keep going to where we're we're heading with no this it's not thing. that well it's it's not that the, the the bad things wouldn't have happened if all we're assuming that all the bad things that happened happened but we wouldn't have any we wouldn't have this whole 10 year long idea of like the plane sent these signals that let us use our cute, clever math to figure out where it was and now all i have to do is go find it yeah that's the part that is all dependent on this thing the sense of we're going to find it and and the sense of confidence was overwhelming we started this whole podcast, you remember, remember back in episode one, where um, uh, one of the people attached to Peter Waring, who was a lieutenant at the time, attached to the search effort, he was like, every morning he got up and went to work, fully expecting that they were going to find the plane that day. And there was a, one of the, there was a guy uh, attached to the effort who was quoted in the papers, and I often quoted it. He basically said, we have um, a bottle of champagne chilling in the fridge because we know that we've solved the The math is like this perfect math problem. Now, I'm, I'm sure you remember. It sounds like you don't have fond memories of math class, really, but you no. remember having like you have like your teacher would ask you this like complicated problem about Billy has two goats and the goats move 10 miles an hour and the river bridge is 10 miles long and there's a bee that's flying it. And you get all this information and you like and you do you do it in the math and it comes out and it's like 10 miles an hour. And you feel so good because it's like you did all the math and you get this great, clean, nice answer. Boom. It's so satisfying. Um, and so they were 100 percent confident that they well, not 100 percent. At one point, one of the uh, Australian ministers said we are 97 percent confident that we're going to find the plane in this area that the mathematicians had. And I like those odds because 97 percent is good enough to dedicate the resources that they did. So as bad as I am at math, I'm a little bit better with my words. So I believe this would be a denouement of <laughs> As we wrap up this episode, like it seems seems like it's pretty obvious from here. It seems like now all we got to do is go search for it. This was the high watermark of everyone's mood. Yeah, it's a high watermark of everyone's we're, we're, mood, but the denouement for, for our theory, because um, it turns out mm, not so much. Well, there's there's more twists to come. Yeah. There's always more twists to come. But at this point, we didn't know that. We, we had every reason to be optimistic, and we had every reason to think that we had cracked the mystery, we had solved it, and we were going to go get the plane, and then we would pull the plane up off the seabed, and we would find the black boxes that had recorded all the data, and the cockpit voice recorder, which had you know the conversations, hopefully explaining it. And we would be, and this, because remember, we talked about Air France 447 before, which took two years to find on the seabed in the Atlantic. And they didn't know, they couldn't explain why this plane did these strange things that it did. They pulled it off the seabed, they, they decoded the black box, and like, oh, they were able to hear the conversation among the crew members explaining their confusion and what we, they thought one thing was happening, another thing was happening. And the, they could actually, they had data multiple times per second of what the, exactly what the plane was doing, and they were able to recreate exactly what happened to this plane. What are we going to talk about in episode eight? I, I truly have no idea. We are going to talk about what happens after everything seems to have been kind of done and dusted with the BFO data, and we start to, um, some other strange things start to happen. I think we should talk about the acoustic pings. Okay. That's my question. All prediction, right. But All right. Well, again, we're recording these about a week in advance, uh, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little bit more. So we'll sharpen our pencils and we'll get right on that. Okay. That's all I have for you today. What we actually wound up talking about next episode is the surface search in which ships and planes from dozens of countries uh, scanned over millions of square miles of ocean surface and found nothing. Why? Tune in next week and find out. Meanwhile, please like and subscribe. Sign up for the show page at findingmh370.com. For now, this is Jeff Wise saying don't stop looking and don't stop asking hard questions. See you next time.